Welcome to Shift Watch. I'm your host, Starbuck. In this special edition, I felt it's important to report on the sustained space weather we're enduring. So first, Miguel, Stefania, and I had a chance to share experiences together about Mount Shasta and other instances that began back in 2019 and have been escalating ever since. Next, here is an update from the Earthmaster reviewing the current elevated nature of the seismic activity that's growing and shares an illustration of the planet's tectonic plates for us to understand better. Then, this was sent my way a few days ago. And although a few have commented with, that's AI, I wouldn't rule out different light energies interacting with us, given my own experiences that were photographed. And finally, because of the cosmic activity affecting our planet and its unusual spiking recently, I feel it's important to educate others on these physical aspects of the Earth shifting. I've included a clip from another space weather monitoring site, this one, Wages World. Here, he's going over the readings from this storm we are currently seeing, and I like his use of all the tools available to us explaining this new space weather territory we find ourselves in. The, the, the both of us, like, we wanted to go to Shasta for, you know, we're like, we, you know, uh, for, I don't know, we felt like it, you know, yeah. and later Had on, you've we, been there before. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, yeah, we've been okay. uh, three times now, but, uh, but before we never, you know, we didn't, uh, but everywhere we looked, you know, there were hints like Shasta, we would or see on Saint, Saint Germain, you know, um, yeah. And uh, and then later on, we we you know uh, when uh, she started channeling, you know, we uh, uh, figure out that was Saint Germain kind of like sending us. It was coming from you know uh, somewhere, right? So and then uh, we uh, after the uh, it was two thousand and twenty one, right? We went yeah. for the first time. So we went there and we didn't know anything, you know. We just uh you know went to the mountain and we knew a, a bit about saint germain you know we we used to do like the i am we did like for about like a year every day you know the the um, the decrees right and then when we arrived at shasta uh so we went you know close to the mountain and then we went everywhere ascension rock uh, you know we uh, took a lot of pictures a lot of pictures right yeah. so and then afterwards uh, so we're looking at the pictures and we're like, what is this? And all the pictures, we, there were like UFOs all around, uh, us, all around like... us, all around us, you know, like in the back and, and we're like, wow, uh, you know, so, okay. So, and we're trying to, you know, little by little, uh, slowly try to, you know, take it all in. And so we, we came back to Los Angeles and then, um, so have we you had of, experiences like that anywhere else before that? No, no, okay. No. Uh, okay. I think, I think uh, it was after a, a week when we come back from yeah. Shasta. Yeah, so after a week, right? We, and then we, we were kind of like, uh, we got obsessed with like, we watched every documentary about UFOs, ETs, and I, I think any, anything that was like on Gaia or... And, and, you know, anywhere that we could yeah. find material, you know. But then after we have like, uh, we had a, like a really big download. Download. Like we yeah. couldn't explain so, because we didn't know what it was, but what, we have the same dream. We, we, we have, were like a uh, 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 line. Like, we're, we're like next to each other. And then yeah. it was like one night, it was like one week or two. I, I don't remember. Like or for, one week after. After we came yeah. back from Shasta. So, and then it was um what at the time we call it a download right so and then we we found out that it was like um light codes right so it was like a lot of information yeah we were coming down it's like the matrix right like <laughs> yeah. coming down and 
and we're having at the same time. At the same time, and we were shaking. Shaking, like, like we couldn't, yeah. we couldn't move. We were like shaking, looking at each other, like, and, what's going on? Like, and then we would, so we, and it was for like eight or nine hours. We would like wake up and like look at each other. Are you, are you getting it? Are you receiving it? It was, was really, really intense. And I would, I would um, shout like Orion, you know, in, in Portuguese, like Orion, you know, like, uh, uh, so it was, I don't know. You know, and at the time, now we we made a more sense of it, you know. But at the time, we're like, "What was that?" You know, and when it happens for the first time, yeah, look, it's outside yeah. of the boundaries of my experiences. So whatever is going on around me certainly is not within the confines of my little third dimensional brain. Yeah, and so yeah. here is where I just beg anybody that listens to any of the things we talk about: be open. Remain open. If you have asked for miracles in the past, then don't refuse them when they freaking show up. That's all I can say. Yeah. We're, timelines are going quicker. Um, spectrums of light and sound are expanding around us in this environment where energetically last year, I don't know that even those of us that might consider ourselves a little more elevated energetically i'm in areas now where this shit's happening around me and it wouldn't have last year because there's just too much white noise then it mm -hmm. doesn't seem to matter right now and to me sure this is all sure. evidence and indications that the shift is this freaking far away yeah and our job is to help prepare the rest of the people that are just beginning to sense something energetically that they can't put their fingers on well sure. believe me i was placed in this put in, in this place so that i could help interpret it in 3d physical terms because all these sensations when i have them i look at them from that perspective how in the hell do i describe this to somebody else who's just along their journey to begin with <clears throat> it's really easy especially when i uh, listen to some of my other colleagues i've come up with and i, and I listen to myself back when I start to flow, I start to go down multiple rabbit holes and they can't keep up. Well, I don't know what's coming out and that's why it's just good for me to kind of stop. But it's, it reminds me, once you get to a level, you speak from that level. Yeah. You can't help yeah. to articulate that way, but you're going to start to talk about phrases and stuff. Nobody's going to understand. So I don't want to suggest we have to dumb it down, but we have to put it into terms. And the more physical it can be, sure. the more people resonate with it. Hearing it's one thing. Seeing it and hearing it, well, and I got my attention. But when we can connect with the feeling that we've all picked up on now, that we're trying to explain to everybody else, dimensionality will open the doors and you can't help but just see it. You know, we have each other, you know, but uh, it's like, it can be overwhelming. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, because I, we wonder like how many, we know that th there are uh, many more, but how many people are having these kind of experiences, you know? And a lot of time, a lot of times we, because either people don't really know what we're talking about, you know, and some people are open to it and yeah. some people are having the same thing, you know, so it's kind of like different levels of, you know, awareness, yeah. you know. It's a yeah. mix. That's a, yeah. that's a good way to put it. Everybody is on a different level of awareness and it's freaking evolving every day. So, yeah. you know, who do we choose to spend our attention on? And I send love and light to everybody. I'm connected yes, to all yes, yes. of you. However, my attention isn't going to be on trying to convince you of things you haven't con of course, understood yeah. before. Because there's yeah. too many of the rest of us that are elevated that are waiting just the way that you were describing the downloads received and the period of time it took for you to kind of unpack that and understand what it was. So now that you've received your downloads and you have this interpreter filter, the rest of the stuff they're gonna you're gonna continue to receive goes, oh yeah. my God, you will. Yeah, the, um, now the it's gonna come open. at an accelerated rate. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we did see some larger scale activity over here across the Japan area where the uh, Japanese agencies over there have issued a dire mega quake 
warning out here to their public. Uh, and the area of concern sits just right around this area where we've seen that 7.1 earthquake early this morning. Now, there's been a handful of aftershocks, including uh, at least one 5.4 there in the Japan area and of course quite a few other quakes as well. Uh, they fear that this earthquake activity today is a sign that things may be ramping up here across this area called the uh, Nankai subduction zone, the Kumo Ridge area. This region is very capable of producing a mega quake. Uh, check out this article here that they put out uh, in Japan from Tokyo. This is the English version here. Uh, Japan sees a higher risk than usual, a usual risk of mega quake off the Pacific coast. So the Japanese weather agency said Thursday that the risk of a massive earthquake occurring around the Nankai trough that runs along the Pacific coast may have become uh, or have become higher than usual, issuing the first such advisory of its kind. Goodness, right? So in the worst case scenario, a powerful trembler. Uh, could shake a wide area of Japan and uh, create, obviously, a, a subsequent tsunami. Here's the warning. The Japanese government has predicted there is a 70 to 80% chance of a magnitude 8 to 9 quake occurring along the Nankai Trough within the next 30 years. So that's a fairly high percentage, um, and that could create a big deal. 800 kilometers here of... Um, subduction zone in this area now i want to show you a little bit about history in this area this is the uh, trough zone uh, the major concern area in the japan region that specific area sits right in this region right here and that does include the um the activity that we've seen today just barely on the western edge over here and it looks as though the occurrence level here, there's it's kind of an odd subduction zone area. This this region is definitely not like the Cascadia subduction zone over here across the Pacific Northwest. It doesn't add up a whole bunch of strain here as quick as this area does, which is right off here, right? This is going to be the area of concern, this area of Japan. you got the Filipino plate here in the in kind of a salmon color light red dark medium red <laughs> take, take your choice here um in this area is the subduction zone there's a couple different subduction zones here the philippine trench and all over the place I, I tend to call this area the crunch zone because this is where all the plates are colliding and subducting if you look at the pacific plate here that's going to be this yellowish color arrows pointing to the northwest filipino plate here moving off to the west into this area the eurasia plate backing up all that strain so all these plates colliding and subducting it doesn't take hundreds and hundreds of years to build up strain for a big mega quake out here and this area has been known to have earthquakes on average between 90 to 200 years along the subduction zone and it seems as though they come in uh, pairs uh, they often occur in pairs with it, where a rupture along one part of the fault is followed by a rupture elsewhere on the fault uh, soon following that uh, the original quake, like the uh, 1854 earthquake. Uh, and then uh, I think the next day or so, they seen uh, another larger quake on that same segment. The 1944 earthquake along that uh, subduction zone was followed by a 1946 earthquake. So, you know, they, they definitely appear to be coming in pairs. Although one earthquake uh, ruptured along the entire fault. That was the 1707 earthquake there.
please share this one out. This is uh, this is something, you know, if we're ever going to share stuff out, it needs to be stuff like this. Um, this is really what people want to uh, know, especially when we get things that are unexpected, like what we're seeing now. Um, and I don't want to blow this out of proportion either, um, but this is very big space weather news, okay? When a solar storm overachieves or um, becomes stronger than what we had expected, this is actually happening um, kind of in the same time frame we kind of expected, but it didn't, the way we were seeing things, these CMEs that were coming at us must have been in, in a such a, a staged manner that they're hitting a little different than what we expected. Um, and the reason I say that is because of the strength of the storm. Um, and, you know, when you're getting a train of CMEs coming at you, you know, what happens there, right? Um, but what you guys are looking at here, this is a Giro electric model. Um, and what this is, it's the geoelectric field at the surface. Now, this is here. They put this model together. We're working with the Canadian Agency and the USGS here um, to try to bridge a gap between space weather and forecasting seismic activity. And Because we know space weather has an effect on that. So what they're looking at is geoelectric field, not geomagnetic. But they do um, affect one another immediately and almost every time. So when we see one or the other react, we take a look at both. And um, as you can see here, this is definitely elevated in a way that, you know, it's not like, oh my gosh, run for the hills, that kind of a thing. No, it's not that. But this is very, very elevated. And, um, you know, I'm not really sure how long all this is going to last. I do think we've already dropped down back to a G3. But that is typical. Um, we will bounce back and forth. And um, we've already been seeing that as, I, you know, as I talk to you right now, we've been I've been watching this, and um, I was gonna wait a little bit. I was gonna do one really early, but we were at like a G three, a G two, I think at that time, and I was like, you know what, let's just wait because a G two, you know, yeah, we'll report that if that's as big as it gets. It's there's not a need for me to jump out here, um, but there's really not a need for me to jump out here right this second, other than the fact that, you know, this is stronger, and I want people to be aware because we're seeing a roar in over 30 states. Now, again, there's a whole lot of theories of what's going on with that. Why are we seeing more, uh, more severe storms with uh, activity that would have typically in the past not really done that? Um, I do think that this has something to do, and I've said this about the Aurora model, right? That our magnetic field is weakening. I mean, that's just a fact. Now, is that what's causing us to see these things? I can't land on that 100%. I can't. So what I'm saying is, I, I keep my mind open, I listen to everybody, and as things happen, I just try to understand what's going on. And uh, right now, we're in a severe storm that might not, should have been severe. I don't know. Um, again, it wasn't forecasted. They actually, they have been uh, changing their forecast often. <laughs> <laughs> today uh, that's what i'll say and that's not uh, out of the ordinary either for a storm like this when you get um cmes that train together like this did here i'll show it to you okay when you get all these cmes coming right at you like this it becomes very very difficult because if one of these cmes isn't doing what they think it's going to do it's going to affect the rest of them and that's probably what's happening and it kind of looks to me like they, we may have had something like a two or three of them kind of really cannibalized real, cl really close to one another. And it basically gave us one big gigantic hit. But there was something more in store for us. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, but before I do that, I do want to show you the HP. This is typically, this is really for all essential purposes, the same indice. This is an HP. It's the same type of measurement um, indice that we're using, but this is a 30-minute increment. 30-minute data plots. These over here are three-hour averages. So we get to see more real time here, and we can kind of look inside of those three hours and see what happened to have them average out to a an 8. Okay? So... 
that's that's the advantage of this. Looks like what happened here is we were in between two different CMEs and we dropped down and then all, all of a sudden we got hit again. And this one, because of we were already here, instead of down here like they were forecasting with the G2, that's why this one up here. Because this is what's, this is exactly what we're seeing. Right now, it looks as though we're down to a G... That G1? Yeah. Right now, the last 30-minute data point is a G1. So are we going to go back up? I don't know. All I can tell you is we got really close, guys, to a G5 right there. Um, but what I will show you here, this is the Magneto pause, right? This is the Australian model, and I'm using this one on purpose because it's simple to understand. This is the our bow shock. Space weather is coming from left to right from the sun. It hits our bow shock, which, well, it creates the bow shock, I guess. It's probably better. We got space weather that hits our magnetic field. That point of contact is called the bow shock. That first point of contact. So when it gets compressed, we get compression and rapid expansion. I talked about that last night. I'm not going to do that today. But this, this actually got pushed back real close to our satellite line. Okay, so watch watch what happens here. I'll run this again. And you see how close it's getting? So what happens is, if that gets inside of that, it exposes our satellites to direct space weather. And that could be bad for the, for the satellites. You're throwing a whole bunch of extra density in here. At the same time, you're throwing a bunch of high, high charged particles. Now, um... This is our magnetosphere here on a different model. This is the NOAA model. And this is a very, very visual. And it gives us very, very intense visual representation of what's going on. Okay? Um, as you can see up here, this is the velocity. This is speed. Now, you're seeing that that's definitely an increase. The darker reds are the fastest particles here. Um, and the darker blues are the same. They're just moving in opposite directions because we're talking about polarity here, negative and positive. So that's representing what direction that's, that uh, those particles are moving. Now when we get these little wraparound things, those are reconnections. We get hit in the front, those particles get into our magnetosphere, and then magnetics take over again, and it'll draw those particles right back. Okay? So that's what's happening there. Um, we do get like cosmic rays and stuff from behind us, but typically um, what, what we normally see on these models is exactly what I said. Because you can see us get hit in the front first almost every time, and then shortly thereafter you'll see a little hook kind of signature, and it'll pop back over, and we're just reconnecting is all that that is. Okay? Now, this is density. So, yeah. It's just showing you a lot of dense, dense material. Now, listen. It stops right here on this color. So if things are more dense than that, we can't see it here on this model. So I would point that out, because it can be more dense than what they have here. All right? It's just typically that they don't have to go any further than that, and probably didn't think that they really needed to. So when we get above that during bigger events, it can't really represent exactly how dense the material is, which is why you have to go look at the data. Okay? That's why the boring graphs are important. <laughs> okay, now, this is the magnetic pressure. Now, I want you guys to look at this. You see how we're kind of angled this way? Right? This is the uh, north-south, okay? See the numbers here? Negative 10, 10, 20, 30. Negative 10, negative 20, negative 30. You see that? It says Z, right? What's that representing? That's the Z-axis, right? B, Z. B, Z. You hear me? BZ, I say it all the time. So when it's pointing to the south, this is what I'm talking about. Okay? So understand that. Notice the notice kind of where it's pointing. <laughs> so it's already negative. We know it's negative six or more because I've already looked. But um, let's see here. Where can I take you to? Right here. Okay? This is Discover. Now look at where look how far south it went. Negative 20. That's significant, guys. And it hasn't been above negative six for, uh, oh gosh, multiple hours, almost all day. This is a one day uh, plot here. So almost 24 hours. I mean, we got some, you know, some uh, areas here where it wasn't. 
and I, I talked about these last night. But shortly after I got off stream last night, we went into negative six, and it just kept doing it. So, yeah. Now look at this, guys. You see that? That says G3, latest reading. That, see, this is what this is what I was talking about. And what, what I mean is, let me go back to the HP. This next reading, it may be up here again. 